and I did it yesterday. So um, that is, um, oops, sorry, I got to pop, continue. okay. Um, so yeah, so I just like to start there, <laughs> that these are, these are suggestions. Um, there are so many different ways of doing things. Um, and I think what, where I wanted to start today was um, really talking about our, our children's development because it helps us as parents understand where our kids are coming from. And especially when we're trying to manage behaviors or there might be some problematic behaviors that we're uh, dealing with right now, understanding where our kids are coming from and really what's happening in their brain and in their body is the best place to start. And this is the foundation. And I think this is what we can build on in future uh, parent workshops that I hope to do for Wildwood. Um, so today we're going to start with really an overview of child development to help you get an understanding of where your child is right now. And um, something that's so important is that every child develops differently. And I know as a mom, uh, when my child, you know, wasn't walking at 12 months, and then he wasn't walking at 13 or 14 months, I started to have that panic of, oh my gosh, what's going on? What's going on? Um, however, he was talking uh, using words at a very young age. And so I always talk about development um, as, you know, kids are going to excel in certain areas. Uh, gross, gross motor or cognitive language development. Um, they might be up here in one and down here in other. Others, they develop at different rates. Every child is different. Unfortunately, in science, we have to have our averages and typical development and things like that. Um, so we'll get kind of average ages of when things happen, but development really does happen over a lifespan. Um, many things we want to see in our children don't happen until they're in their 20s. So um, I, I just like to say that because we're going to talk about typical development. There are things that interfere with typ typical development, um, like trauma or adverse life events. Um, but today I'm just going to do a really brief overview of where our children are right now, kind of in that two to six range. Oh, and I also, let's, here we go. Okay. Um, one more thing, Th this is being recorded and uh, I will provide the slides. I do ask that if you are watching this on your own or you have the recording of the slides that you don't share it. Um, this is just for Wildwood families. I ask that because I reference so many wonderful people in the field of um, neuro neuropsychology and development. And while I reference them, I do use a lot of their work. Um, and I just would never want this to be out there kind of in the universe pretending that this is my stuff when I really just pull from so many different experts. Um, so I just ask that you just keep it to yourself um, and not share out there in the world. Um, all right, thank you. So what is behavior? Uh, when our children are acting a certain way, a lot of times we want to ask, you know, what is going on? What is this behavior? I'm going to close my window so I can see my slides. There we go. Um, so we, we see this problematic or confusing behavior and we're trying to think, how do we get rid of it? What is going on? I don't want this to happen anymore. How do we get rid of it? Really, we should be asking, what is this behavior telling us about our child? What is going on? So today I'm gonna uh, reference a lot of Mona Delahoot's work. Uh, I really like it because it's, it's beyond behaviors. It's really diving underneath and, and asking what is going on. We have to be detectives sometimes. We have to really ask that question of what is happening with our kid because that's going to help us address the problem behavior. Um, and it's not so much about getting rid of it. It's helping meet the needs of our children. So we also have to ask, are we observing intentional misbehavior or is it actually a flight or flight unintentional stress response? And so really is, is it this um, physiological response that's happening inside our kid um, rather than this intentional misbehavior? I know that I make that mistake a lot of assuming that my child is choosing to do something. He is choosing to um, throw the things on the floor and make me mad. He is choosing to have a tantrum. Um, and often it's, it's 
that's the skill that he has in that moment to know how to handle what's going on inside of him. And it's our job as adults to help teach them different skills. So just like you wouldn't yell at a baby to stop crying um, because they don't have the skills yet, um, we have to understand that misbehavior is, is just a reflection of our children being dysregulated um, or not having the healthiest physiological state. Um, so yelling at our five-year-old to stop um, doing whatever they're doing is going to have the same adverse response as yelling at a baby to stop crying, which really is nothing and it's just going to create more of a um, escalated dynamic. So I really like this quote from Mona Delahook. Um, she says, we believe that children can overcome their challenges if only they put their minds to it. We become cheerleaders hoping to help children will themselves into a better behavior. And we feel disappointed in them and then ourselves when the behaviors continue despite our best efforts. We falsely assume that children of a certain age have a volitional control over their emotions and behaviors. That assumption is the main reason that many techniques to help children with behavioral challenges fail and they take a toll on children um, and parents and on mental health and relationships. So again, I think we've all been there where we just think if they could just put their mind to it that children could be better. They, they would stop doing this thing that we don't want them to do. Um, and often they can't because developmentally they aren't, they aren't there yet. So the first step in addressing our child's behavior is understanding where they are developmentally. Um, and that development happens over a lifespan. So there are a number of, diff uh, a number of different developmental philosophies. If anyone took, you know, Psych 101 or have went through Psych courses, you probably learned a lot about them. Um, so Piaget and Erickson are two big ones that I'll reference today, but then there are some um, more um, uh, recent developmental tracks or processes that people have come up with to talk about social emotional development and the brain. Um, but like I said, it happens over a lifespan. It happens differently for every child. Um, something I also want to point out is when an adverse life event happens during a child's de development, sometimes they can get stunted in that stage or they might revert back to that stage later in life when something maybe happened or they haven't um, fully um, mastered a skill in that stage. So they revert back to um, a developmental stage of someone typically younger because of those reasons. So I like to point that out because in our kids, we're going to see so much, a lot of um, fluctuating um, and that's very normal. So to start with Piaget, um, I just, for this one, I only went with the age group of most of the children um, who I would, you know, who are at Wildwood, so kind of preschool age. Um, what I like to pull from this, and again, things have changed in science and what we know about the brain, so not all of these things are as relevant anymore, but this idea of egocentrism, so struggling to see from others' points of view. So during this, this, this age of two to seven, our kids are learning this really, really important task of of empathy, of um, taking on you know someone else's feelings, seeing something from someone else's perspective, and um, there's this great little video that I want to show you. It's called the Three Mountains Task. So it it shows us what our children are really seeing, um, and I I bring this up because I think as parents when we um, see our children doing something and we want them to stop, we, we assume that they're seeing the world the same way that we are and they're not. Um, so I just, I'm going to pull up this quick video. Okay. Can you tell me what you see when you look at that from where you're sitting? What are some of the things that you see? Uh... A cat. A cat. And a tree and a bug. Okay, now we're going to do the same thing. Can you tell me what you see when you look at it from that stool? Um, uh, an owl. An owl? Yeah. What, what's, what is that? Uh, a goat. A goat? Yeah. Okay, is there anything else you see? Right there, what is that? A tree. A tree. And that's another, another little tree. Right. 
And can you tell me what I see when I look at this from where I'm sitting right here? Okay, so just to stop real quick. So um, in the first part of this video, we see someone who's obviously on the younger spectrum of this um, stage of development. And they're asked to look at something and say what they see and then go to the other side and see what they see uh, and then ask what the other person is seeing. Obviously his response is what he is seeing. Um, so he's definitely more in that egocentric um, type of, uh, of development still. Okay, so can you tell me what you see from that side? A fox and a bone and a volcano and yeah. a rock and a big fat Christmas tree. Now, Braxton, can you tell me what I see from where I'm sitting? A bird and a river and a volcano and a horse and a rock and a tree. Okay. So, oops, nope, we don't want to go on to the next one. Um, so back to my slides here. Um, okay. So what I like about this video, again, is that it shows us that it's changing. So our, our children are developing. This um, egocentrism is, is changing um, during those two to seven, ages two to seven. And um, he was able, the, the older boy was able to say what the woman was seeing. Um, he could take her point of view. Um, and so when we're addressing things with our kids, I think it's really important to, to, to think about our kid and think, okay, are they understanding what I'm saying? Are they seeing this from my perspective? Do they understand why I'm frustrated right now or why this is bothering me right now or why that bothered their friend or why their friend didn't like it or why you know, they want chocolate for dinner and they can't have chocolate for dinner. And can they understand the reasons why? No, a lot of times they just know what they want and it's really just about them and their point of view. And so it's important to take this into account when we start addressing these behaviors because often parents tend to over talk and we think that they understand something that they, they really aren't. Um, but this is developing during that stage um, from kind of two to seven. And once they get a little bit older, they are able to develop something that's called the theory of mind, which is taking somebody else's um, perspective. And that starts to happen more around ages four. Um, and, and then it develops kind of um, as they as they go on. So what other things are developing during this time um, are language and thinking, but they're still thinking in very concrete terms. So again, reasoning can be very hard because it's very black and white. They want something, they can't have it, they're angry. They don't understand that chocolate for dinner is unhealthy and all these reasons why. They're very, the thinking in very concrete terms. So take that into account as a parent when you are trying to reason with your young child um, that developmentally they might not be there yet. They might not understand some of the things that you are trying to explain to them. Um, at this stage, kids learn through play. And I'm sure you see this. This is how you know they learn at school. They process things through play. Um, that's why play therapy can be so amazing because this is how they're processing through their day, what they're learning. Um, everything comes out through play. Um, and they probably really want to play with you at home. Um, that is how they connect. Um, and again, they still struggle with, with logical thinking and, and taking others' point of view, um, but that kind of progresses, pro, um, progresses as they get a little bit older. So Erickson stage, I do the first kind of zero to 11 years. Um, there are many different stages in this one. I tend to like this one a little bit more. Um, so the way that Erickson came up with these stages is that each stage has a conflict. So the conflict for birth to 18 months is trust versus mistrust. And it is the, it's, um, the hope during this phase that the child learns how to kind of get over this conflict, to move past it. And so during this time, their babies are learning basic survival, survival skills and they're developing that sense of trust and safety. It's how they're forming those healthy attachments with caregivers. 
And to successfully move through this stage, there will be a balance of risk and safety. So knowing that if there is a risk, I am still safe um, there and, and that my caregiver will be there to take care of me. Um, my basic needs are going to be met. And this gives children a sense of hope. So that is kind of successfully moving through the first stage here. Um, if there is trauma during this time, you tend to see kids who have, um, you know, maybe insecure attachments with care and insecure attachment with caregivers. Um, they tend to see the world as kind of a scary place. Um, so that's if maybe a child has not progressed through this stage. Um, in the healthiest of ways and um, don't have that, that right balance. The next phase is early childhood, so two to three years. So this is where some of our children are right now, um, autonomy versus shame and doubt. So this is really where you're seeing that, um, that urge to be independent and to have control. This is where a lot of tantrums come yeah. from. Um, so a lot of this independence and control comes around their body. So potty development. So I, I purposely call it potty development because we cannot train our children to be ready to use the toilet properly. Um, it is a developmental stage. It is part of their development. Every child develops differently when it comes to this. Um, but this is part of that kind of two to three years where they're learning um, kind of what it means to go potty. They want to go potty, um, eating, clothes. They want to exercise this control. They can do things themselves. Um, children who struggle or are shamed for having accidents during this time or for putting their shoes on the wrong feet or things like that, they'll develop a poor sense of self personal control. So they'll think that I can't do this. I'm not good enough. And that can lead to feelings of shame and doubt. So it's really important during this time that um, we find that balance with our young children um, by giving choices, um, making sure, you know, those choices are uh, choices that we as the adults are also kind of in control over, but we give choices and that successful balance of autonomy and shame and doubt um, is, is this belief that children can act with intention. So um, they, they, within reason and limits. So we want them to be able to do what they wanna do, but obviously we st still set those boundaries. Um, so kids can get stuck in this, this stage for sure. Um, I think potty development can be a really challenging time for kids. It can be a really traumatizing time. Um, so we might see some kids kind of revert, revert back into this stage when they're um, dysregulated or feeling upset. Um, and and that's, that's normal. Um, but then we as parents kind of help work with them. Um, to have them have this sense of control um, over themselves and independence, again, within, within boundaries. So preschool years, so kind of, again, where a lot of our kids are right now, this initiative versus guilt. Um, so again, this idea of assert, asserting power and control, this is very important to their identity right now. And this is a lot, a lot of this happening through play and with the, their social interactions. Um, Success in this stage are it's kids feeling capable, they can do something, they're a leader, they have a sense of purpose, they have confidence. Sometimes kids in this stage will um, exert too much power um, or have an unwillingness to work with others. And I really see this in my own child right now. This, um, I, I wanna play this game. I wanna do this thing. No, I wanna pretend if you know my child, I wanna pretend to be a baby cheetah. No, baby cheetah. And the other kid wants to be something else. You know, like this is what I wanna do and I'm unwilling to work with you sometimes. That is a natural part of this development. And when this is met with disapproval um, or kids don't wanna play or maybe an adult um, you know, comes in and says, you're wrong. You know, if, there's, if there's not a right balance there, this can result in, in a sense of guilt. Um, so that balance of having initiative and a willingness to work with others is what's going to help establish this positive sense of purpose and having confidence. Um, I give this example to of my own child who shifted from one preschool to another last year. And it was really interesting to see him kind of come from a place where he felt really confident. Um, and again, we're going through COVID and things were very strange anyways, um, but have him sort of have to reassess himself during this stage um, where he didn't really feel the most confident or have this positive sense of 
purpose um, and sort of have to redevelop that a little bit after having some big changes that happened um, during during that time frame for him. And I say that because our kids are so resilient and just because they have a hiccup or you maybe see them reverting to some of these more maladaptive ways of handling things does not mean they're stuck there. It means, again, that we help them work through it um, and develop new tools. Um, and so the last stage I'll talk about is school age because some of our kids are kind of transitioning into this right now. So it's five to 11 years. Um, and this is the industry versus inferiority. And it's, you know, as kids are starting to learn new skills, especially going into kindergarten, um, where encouragement from parents and teachers can lead to these feelings of competence and belief in their skills and belief in themselves, whereas little encouragement can lead to self-doubt. Um, so this is where adults can really come in um, to just say, oh my gosh, you know, you're working really hard and, you know, encourage your kids, even if there is a hiccup, even if they get a bad test score, um, that we are their cheerleaders and we do help them have this belief in themselves. And um, I think recognizing that at this time too, there are so many new social and academic demands uh, that are gonna be very different for our kids as they go into elementary school. And so success in this stage can lead to that feeling of competence. Um, failure can lead to feelings of inferiority. You might already see that in some of our, you know, five to six year olds, or if you have some older kids where there's a lot of comparing that starts to happen at this time. Um, he or she has this, he or she can do this better than me. So they start to really, um, they're developing that identity and they can compare themselves to others. And so that, you know, sometimes can be a hard thing. And it's just kind of coaching our own children to, you know, be, you know, we can only worry about ourselves. We can work on, you know, our own skills and things like that. Um, but that balance of um, that, belief in their abilities can help them handle tasks that are before them. So the next one is a more current uh, social emotional developmental process and it, it can get a little scientific and so I will try to keep it basic but I think this one's so helpful in understanding our child's brain and physio physiological responses to things and um, so this is coming from Mona Delahook who I, I really like, um, it's Beyond Behaviors is her book. So she references a study that was um, done by the Zero to Three Initiative where they asked parents um, when children, when do children have the impulse control to resist the desire to do something forbidden or that you don't want them to do? And that 56% of parents believe children have the impulse control to resist the desire to do something forbidden before the age of three, um, which is just, you know, that's, kind of wild because I think we do sometimes think that our kids are able to not do something, you know, if we say, hey, don't touch that, that they're not going to touch it when they really haven't developed that impulse control yet. Um, or they're still in that e egocentric stage of not being able to take someone else's perspective. Um, and their brains just haven't developed um, as, as far as we think that they have quite yet. Um, and within that group, 36% of parents believe that children under two have this kind of self-control. And so she coins this as an expectation gap that parents often have between what we expect children to do and what they can actually do. I am guilty of this all the time and I have been. And the awareness of it really does help me sometimes or helps me go back and repair with my son and say, listen, I'm really sorry I reacted that way, recognizing that he, it really wasn't his fault. He just isn't there yet. So she talks about these six key processes of social emotional development. Um, and really the um, foundation of this um, process is that controlling emotions and behaviors is a neurodevelopmental process. So it develops over time through a child's relationships with caregivers. Um, that self-control, which is our executive functioning, um, really doesn't even develop until our mid-20s. That's our frontal cortex isn't fully developed until we're about 25. And so it's taking this into account when we're, we're working with our kids, um, especially when we want to work on emotion regulation. We think that our kids should be able to regulate themselves, talk about their feelings, um, and oftentimes they have not mastered some of these really basic um, uh, developmental stages that 
they need to be able to properly regulate their feelings. And that happens again from now until their 20s and even over the lifespan of being able to really be in tune with what we're feeling. Um, children are often taught with reinforcement schedules that assume they have control over their emotions and behaviors. So, and I'm going to talk about some behavior charts and some different forms of, of discipline and consequences a little bit later because some people like those and it does work for some kids. Um, but we kind of take this one size fits all approach with kids that these reinforcement schedules should work for everyone. And they don't because often they don't have the skills that we think they should have. Just because a child can control themselves some of the time does not mean that they have control of themselves all the time. Um, so this is a process and they're going to have one day where they're great and regulated and they got a lot of sleep and um, everything feels pretty pretty good. And then the next day they're a hot mess because things are off and they're dysregulated and they're reverting back to some of those um, developmental stages from maybe previous years. Um, and then again, individual differences are so important. Um, we're given general timeframes, but no child is the same when it comes to development. So this is a lot of information and, and you don't have to read it all. I'll just go through it. Um, but what I want you to pay attention to are the questions. So it's kind of the B column for each of these. When your child is, is acting out or there's just a behavior you're really confused about and you're trying to address um, is kind of going back and asking, are they in one of these stages right now? Are they kind of reverting back to maybe an earlier developmental stage for whatever reason, because they're dysregulated? And um, is this how we need to be approaching the behavior at this time? So the first one is the capacity for calm alert attention. So this is our newborn babies. And this is the ability to regulate their sensations. What we know about infants is they are, everything is coming into their brain through their mouth for the most part. Um, and then as they get a little bit older into the two to three months, um, it's the sight, sound, a, a lot of sensations in their bodies. So that is how they're bringing um, uh, stimulation into them and into their brains. And the question we, we ask for this stage is, are we calm and alert in the body? So are they taking in these sensations? Are they, can they be soothed if they need to? Does nursing, you know, does nursing help soothe? Does the pacifier, um, does the shushing, all those kind of things we do with our, in, our infants. Um, so can they be soothed through these senses, their five senses, and that is how they're starting to regulate themselves. Um, and sometimes that takes a babe that takes a, a little person until they're a year old. It's not always three months. It can take much longer. But this is how children begin to regulate and it's coming through their senses. The next stage is trust and engagement. So two to five months, again, this can also be over the lifespan. Some of us are still working on this, um, but that feeling of loving attachment, so kind of hearing some of the, the Erickson and Piaget stuff in there. Um, so this is when they're starting to create those attachments between a child and a caregiver. They're sharing an emotional connection. Um, this is the framework for emotional regulation. This is what we are trying to create with our little person um, is that we they feel attached to us, they feel that connection, the connection is regulating to them, um, and they're starting to smile at us and they're getting that back and forth. And are we engaged and enjoying each other? So I think this is a, an important question because sometimes with my five-year-old, um, we might not be on the same page and we might not be engaged and enjoying each other in that moment. And when he's having a meltdown or a tantrum, he's maybe reverting back to this trust and engagement stage of development. And I need to keep that in mind that we just need to go and really establish some strong connections at that point. Um, I don't need to be explaining to him why he can't have chocolate for dinner. I need to be getting on his level and connecting with him because that is where he, he is in that moment. Um, the next stage is nonverbal communication. So they say six to 12 months, again, can be across the lifespan. Um, this is two-way purposeful communication. So we're building on that next level of connection that was just kind of smiling, sharing that emotional connection. But this is baby does something and we respond back. 
Uh, this is often nonverbal. This is social communication. This is happening through gestures, without words. And the question to ask is their consistency and our back and forth rhythm. And what I, when I ask what may inhibit this, when I was reading through this, what really kept popping into my mind was our cell phones. And what can inhibit back and forth rhythm when I'm doing this and my child's trying to talk to me? Um, and it doesn't just have to be the phone, but it can be if I'm busy with something else and he wants my attention. And and, and this can really disrupt some of the, the rhythm. And so a question to ask yourself is when your child, you, you look over and he's standing on the counter with a knife or like something in his hand that he shouldn't have, be like, oh my gosh, what was I just doing? Was I just on my phone? Was I just watching the TV? What did he want my attention? And I wasn't giving it to him. So some of that awareness as a parent of what is my child doing right now? Is he trying to get my attention and I'm not giving it to him? And is this why I ju he just dumped all of the Cheerios out on the floor, right? So um, that could be a good question to ask yourself. So the next one is social problem solving, nine to 18 months. Um, so we had the back and forth, that, which was nonverbal and through gestures, um, but now we're going to expand it to the child having the ability to uh, meet a goal. So holding your hand, bringing you over to the freezer and pointing up at the ice cream saying, I want ice cream, right? I can get my, my needs met. I can have these gestures. I have a goal and I know how to go about getting that met. Um, so a question to ask if there's some problem behavior is, are we solving these problems together? Um, is what your child trying to tell you in that moment, I want attention? I'm trying to hold your hand, I, um, or I want a hug, I want control out of this dynamic, but I'm going about that in a different way because I don't know how to get my goal met right now. Um, so that can be a good, good question to ask. Is he you know, going back to this social problem solving stage of not knowing how to get a goal met and so instead you see an adverse reaction or behavior you don't wanna see. So finally, they get to symbolic thought, and this is where they can use words. So they, so symbols are words, um, so ways to get their needs met um, through play. Um, they can describe, eventually knowing how to describe feelings. Um, and so this is where we want to see more talking, playing, reflecting, writing. Are kids able to use these symbols, these words, to start to describe what they need? And this is where when I do a lot of work on emotion regulation and emotional literacy, that we kind of will focus on kind of five and six, which is how do we help um, develop some of this emotional regulation by giving children words and symbols to describe themselves. And the last one is building bridges with others. And it's really just um, children having emotional ideas between two people. So recognizing I have a need or sorry, I have a typo in here. I'm mad, not made. I'm mad because you're mean. So recognizing that I'm having this emotional experience and I can name my feeling. And it's because of something that you are doing or something else that is happening. So that's pretty complex. Um, recognizing sensations and bodies that might be associated with different feelings um, and you can attach it to another person, the how, the what, the where, the why, this is really the foundation for executive functions. Um, and this is what children will continue to build on or what humans build on for the rest of their life. So this is, I know a lot of information, but I think when we're having these problems with our kids, it can be helpful to go back and say, okay, what am I missing right now? What is this behavior telling me? Is there a need that's not met? Is he, is he or she not feeling connected with me? Um, are we not having this back and forth rhythm so they feel kind of disconnected from me right now? Um, and I guess the biggest takeaway from this is we as adults play a huge role in our child's behavior. And that's a lot to take on because we wanna just think that, okay, it's just the kid and they're just gonna get over it, but it, it really does take a lot from us. So understanding the brain is really important. Um, I do a lot of work with kids and you guys can start doing this with your own if you haven't already. I take from, the, from Dan Siegel, kind of the hand model of the brain. Um, this is our wise owl, so the frontal cortex. Uh, this is what, what is developing, you know, starting kind of in toddlerhood, um, executive functioning, and this goes all the way through um, 
what they call it later adolescence, which is age 25, basically. Um, so this is where kids are learning how to control their feelings, have impulse control, um, attention, emotional regulation and literacy, planning, um, risk assessment. So this is why teenagers will do really silly things sometimes because they are not, they can't assess risk the same way that an adult can't because their frontal cortex is not fully developed yet. So we call this, when I work with kids, is the wise owl. And um, the wise owl, we want to be in charge. We really want to foster our wise owl being in control. But sometimes our wise owl uh, flies away and our watchdog comes out. And our watchdog represents the amygdala. So this is our fight or flight. And this is when kids are dysregulated. Um, <laughs> sorry, so I just rang my doorbell. Um, so this is the flight or fight mode. So this is when, um, the way I describe it to kids is that they are, um, the, the watchdog is really important and we want our amygdala to function and we want watchdog to come out. And we want him to come out maybe if we're being chased by a bear or a bear jumps out and we're scared and we need to run away. That is our natural fight flight response. Sometimes our watchdog gets confused and he comes out when he doesn't need to. And a lot of times that can be if we have a really big feeling, um, if there's something going on where we feel uncomfortable and he might come out and our watchdog goes away and we go into fight or flight mode. And this is um, where you might see a, a big tantrum. Um, this might be, you know, in young kids, it's mostly fighting. It's less flighting, but as they start to get um, a little bit um, older, they might be more retreating into, um, you know, getting really quiet. This is kind of where I would worry if an older kid maybe is feeling a little depressed, um, withdrawn, um, but most of our young kids are fighters and um, the frontal cortex shuts down and they function from this animal brain. And what's so important to understand is when our child is in, when watchdog is out and, and wise owl has flown away, you cannot reason with them they don't have that ability. Their executive functioning skills have, have shut down. So think of it like a computer that shuts down. And if you have an old computer like mine, it takes quite a while to reboot. So you need about 20 minutes to help regulate them, bring them back, have wise owl come back and control. And this is when you can start doing some work with them on boundaries and learning lessons or whatever it is you wanna do, but you cannot reason with your child when they are having a massive meltdown. You just can't. Um, so we're gonna talk about some ways to help get them regulated, but I think this really basic brain development is super important in understanding our children. Um, Mona Delahook, she talks a lot about the ventral vagal system. Um, and our this is basically our parasympathetic nervous system. This is a much more scientific way of talking about the um, fight flight response in the watchdog. And, Basically what we wanna be is in the green, right? When our children feel safe, engaged, like they can learn, they're in the green. Um, when they kind of go into fight or flight mode, they flip their lids, watchdog comes out is when they go in the, either into blue or into red. And again, we cannot reason very well with our children when they're in the blue or the red. Um, especially if they're, they're in the red. It's our job to try to bring them back to the green. And um, I, I, I wanted to not forget to talk about kind of the typical brain versus children who have experienced trauma or adverse life events. Um, a typically developing child will have more um, time in the green, or if they do kind of go to the red or the blue, it is easier for them to come back to that regulated state. Um, children who have experienced trauma or adverse life events um, are sometimes triggered a lot more easily into the red or the blue. Um, sometimes they're, they're permanently in the red or the blue and it's harder for them to get to the green. So I just bring that up. I don't know everyone's life story here, but um, it's important to just recognize that every child is different and some kids will have had experiences that maybe make it a lot easier for them to flip their lids and go into the red or go to the blue. Um, and it might be harder for them to get back to the green compared to other kids. So no, no child is the same. So when we're addressing behavior and let me just see where we are. Oh, okay. Um, 
So it's really important, um, first and foremost, to recognize our own physiological response. If we are really angry and mad, um, then it's probably not the best time to go uh, approach our child. We have to be calm. If we want our child to be calm and regulated, we have to be calm and regulated. And so when you start to see some problem behavior, the first question you can ask, ask is what pathway am I on? Am I in the green or am I in the red? Um, and then what pathway is my child on? Is he still in the green? Can we get somewhere right now um, with me addressing this in a calm way or have they already gone into the red? And I think you know your child and you probably can tell like, oh gosh, we've already surpassed any reasoning and there's already a tantrum happening and there's no way um, you know, that we can reason right now. Um, so don't try, you just are gonna have to connect and we'll talk about that in a second. The next thing is we have to be detectives. What is this behavior telling me? And if you can just take a moment to ask that question. So try to regulate yourself if you're mad, take some deep breaths, try to go in calmly, but also just ask, okay, what is, what is this? What is he trying to tell me right now? Because our be the behavior is telling us something. Our kids do not want to be bad. They do not want to get in trouble. They do not want to have these bad behaviors. They don't want that. That's not what they want. They're not choosing it. So what is this behavior telling us? Um, is it flight or flight? What is their physiological response right now? Are they shutting down? Are they really angry? Are they testing boundaries with me because they're in that kind of stage of development where they want the control? Are they tired? So are basic needs not being met? Are they hungry? Do they want attention, connection seeking from me? Are they trying to have that back and forth? Do they wanna feel connected? Um, are they experiencing a complication within one of their developmental stages that we just talked about, um, which is normal. And so you have to ask that question before you kind of jump in and try to, to mend the problem and fix this behavior. The best thing we can do as parents is connect. Um, Tina Payne Bryson and Dan Siegel talk a lot about connect and redirect. So get on their level, validate their feelings. I can see you're really mad right now. I would be mad too if I wanted chocolate for dinner and I can't have it. Um, so validate, let them feel heard. Don't say you're being ridiculous. Trust me, it doesn't work. Um, so validate their feelings, get on their level, um, kind of have time in versus the time out. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. Um, um, emotional connections help regulate our child. If they're in the red or they're in the blue, that connection with you is going, or, or a, an adult who they feel a strong attachment to is going to bring them back to the green. And that is how we can help address these behaviors. So um, that can be any, sometimes I just gotta get down on the floor next to my kid. Um, if he's having a full on meltdown, like flailing around, um, as much as our instinct is to protect ourselves and say, okay, I'm not gonna be around you because you're hitting right now. Um, that actually is a disconnect. And what I found for my own child is I will be in the same room with you. I want to be by you. I don't feel safe right now when you're hitting, but I'm not going to leave you. I am here with you. I'm not going to leave you. And when you're ready to keep me safe, I would love to give you a hug. And that's such a hard thing to do in that moment because we're mad. I don't like to be hit. I don't like to be screamed at. We, our instinct is to disconnect. What our child is needing from us is connection so that they can regulate because they're looking to us for that regulation. Um, addressing from a developmentally appropriate perspective is, is so important. So when we're trying to reason, we have to understand that our kids don't have that logical thinking yet. They're very black and white and they're very egocentric and they're only thinking about it from their perspective and they can't quite see yours yet. So having that, that um, mindset is, is really important. Um, we can still teach and set boundaries, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. Um, we can use things like positive reinforcement. It has to be developmentally appropriate. And if we must use consequences, we need to make sure that it's tied to the behavior that we wanna modify. I want to have time for questions, so I'm just kind of going to go through this quickly. Um, I really encourage you to check out Ryan, uh, Robin Gobble. That's the same name. Let's I say it out loud. Um, but she has some great, she does a podcast, um, but the page I was reading was What About Consequences? I really like her work. Um, she kind of talks about what is a consequence, and really it's just the thing that happens next. So
So you put your foot on the gas pedal and it moves the car. And some consequences are positive, means we'll do something again. And some are negative, which means we probably will learn and not do them again. Um, oftentimes when we're talking about consequences, we're actually talking about punishments. And um, we can learn from consequences without punishment. Um, but it requires things that maybe our kids aren't quite ready for yet. So this ability to pause, to learn, to pay attention, some executive functioning skills that's happening in this front of our brain, again, not developed fully until we're 25. So um, the real question often is what about a punishment? And she claims kids do not need punishments. What they actually need is connection, co-regulation and felt safety, um, which is kind of feeling that safe, soothe, soothe, secure. If you've ever read this book that I keep holding up, um, they talk a lot about the five S's that our, our children need. Um, so I, I'm not going to read all the way through this and you guys will have it, but basically what she's saying is we have to set the boundaries and, and we as parents have to understand when our children are having behaviors we, we don't want to see that we have to create a setting that's going to help them feel regulated and connected. And, and sometimes that means that maybe my five-year-old can't play upstairs with a peer without an adult because they don't have the skills to do that without getting dysregulated. And so maybe the toys need to be in the room with the adults. So we have to set the stage for our kids to be successful and not expect them to be able to do things that they're not developmentally ready to do yet um, and help keep them regulated. So um, children need boundaries and discipline actually means to teach. So a lot of times I get parents who say, so you're just telling me I can let my kid do whatever they want. And that is not the case. We set boundaries for our children. We teach them, that is our job. Um, we can do that without punishing them. And when children are regulated, when they're in the green, we, set expectations in our home and our household. So this is having those conversations at the dinner table. What are our family values? What are the expectations in our home? I encourage families to make charts, have it up, have go through it with your family and our family. And I, I take from the schools a lot. I love the, we keep ourselves safe. We keep others safe. We keep our home safe. Those are the expectations of our home. We had that up for years. Um, for Charles, because I think it's so very basic and you can link a lot of behavior back to that when they are regulated and ready to learn. Um, our child's challenging behavior is usually telling us something is off. They're dysregulated or have an unmet need. So we just have to keep that in mind that something's off. They're not choosing to be little punks. They're just dysregulated. So we got to help them. Um, and in that moment, we have to take that break and say, okay, I got to approach this in a calm way and, and help keep them regulated. And, and Mona Delahook talks a lot about um, it's how we say something is important. We might think our words are really kind, but if I'm, es if I'm escalated and I'm mad and, and, and I have a, a really um, mean tone, it's not going to help. And my son actually will call me out on it and say, you know, mommy, don't talk to me that way because I am, I'm, I'm mad and he can sense that. So we have to come at it, at it um, in a calm way if we really wanna help our children. Um, so the term to um, discipline actually means to teach. Um, it comes from the term disciple, which means teacher or something like that, but it means to teach. Um, and so when our child is regulated, this is when we go over our boundaries and our expectations for our home. Um, if there has been an issue, this is when after they've regulated, we have repair time where we say, hey, we really don't hit in our house. We keep each other safe. And what can we do better next time? Um, we can't do that in the moment when they're having their meltdown though. I use a lot of, I like love and logic. There are some things I don't like about it, um, but there are some aspects that I do. I get an, um, a weekly or monthly email from them with some really great tips. Um, so if you just wanted to look up love, love and logic, you could probably subscribe to that. So this is just taken from some of those emails. I like the language that they use for, yeah, for, for, um, for kids. So instead of just, I think we find ourselves being like, do this, do that, don't do that you know, and saying the same things over and over again, they give different ideas for how to approach um, certain things. So ineffective techniques being, you know, please sit down, we're going to eat now, saying we will eat as soon as you are seated. So just sort of reframing the way that we say things can really help. And again, this is if our child is, you know, calm in the green, 
some of this is more, you know, if they're, it's, it's, they're kind of more progressed in their development. So a two-year-old might not care if you said it this way or that way, but um, uh, I do like some of this stuff. And so I, again, if you wanted to subscribe to those regular emails from Love, Love and Logic, I do like some of it. I don't like all of it. Um, but I do like these things. And the, the one on the other side, this I think was particularly for whining. Um, if you kind of had this, have this child who whines at you all the time, um, we use the phrase, this is really draining my energy often. Um, and again, I think it takes being a little bit more developed in the brain to understand that, that perspective taking. Um, I think if I said this a year ago, Charles would say, I don't care. And I don't know what you're talking about. But right now, when I say you're really taking a lot of energy from me, um, he, I think he understands it. And sometimes he'll even ask, how can I help bring your energy back? What do I need to do? Um, and so I like that language as well. Um, quick thing about behavior charts. Shoot, we're running out of time. Um, it's for positive reinforcement. You got to identify the behaviors that you want to see more of. The goal is to increase positive behaviors. The natural consequence of this is that you will see less of the more maladaptive behaviors. Um, daily rewards are nice. You, if it's a sticker, if it's a smiley face, if it's just something that they get daily, and then having a bigger thing at the end, help have the child help you come up with what these rewards are, mix it up. Don't have it be some big extravagant thing every single time, because then they'll come to expect that. Um, make sure there's still a way to earn something at the end of the week. So what can be really challenging is if it's Thursday and they've already messed everything up and they haven't gotten all their stars and there's no way they can earn the stuffy that they want, then they'll be like, screw it. Um, so make sure that you have something that they can earn, even when it's at the end of the week. You have to be consistent with these. Um, we currently use a chore chart, which we've graduated from more of the behavior chart that we used um, for earning things. And now we use a chore chart, which is, um, you know, he can earn some money to buy the things that he wants. Um, it's a way for us to talk about our family values and expectations. And that's that we help around the house and we clean and we take care of our things. Um, and so it's also a way to increase positive behaviors. But I, again, don't think this would necessarily work for, for, for some younger kids, but Charles being five, this um, is something that I feel like is developmentally appropriate for him. If you want to use consequences, they have to be tied to the behavior. So natural consequences are preferred. So if you don't eat dinner, you go to bed hungry. If you don't put on your socks, this happened this morning, uh, your feet will be cold at school. He put his socks on. Um, but natural consequences are important. Um, negative reinforcement, negative punishment. If you're going to use this, it needs to be tied to behavior. So if it, the tantrum is, if they have a tantrum when you turn off the TV, then they lose TV time. Um, you can't say, oh, you hit your brother and now you lost the iPad. Kids do not see those connections. So it's so important that the, the punishment, if you're going to use it, is tied to the behavior that you want to change. Um, and this is for all ages, teenagers, same way. They don't understand the, you hit your brother, you lost your phone. Like those, they have to be tied to each other. Um, give opportunities to learn and do better next time. Most consequences uh, require a level of cognitive and emotional development that children have not mastered yet. So keep in mind the develop where, where your child is and some of the consequences you give might not make any sense to them at all. So just be aware of that. Time in versus time out. Um, I tend to say timeouts don't work because you are creating a massive disconnect with your child when you're trying to help them regulate. Um, some families will disagree and that is okay. Sometimes children naturally want to go take a break on their own and that is different. And if that is helping them regulate, that's great. If you put your child in a timeout and they completely lose it, they are very, very escalated. Um, they are dysregulated and it's going to take even longer to get them back to where you want them to be. Um, that is my stance on, on timeouts, um, but every family is different. Happy to talk to you more about that if you'd like. And finally, as parents, we have to practice our self-care. We have to be regulated. If we're not regulated, we really can't help our children in that moment. So do what you can to take care of yourself. And I'm just gonna end it there so we can have just a few minutes for questions. I'm happy to stay on if people want to. Well, there is one question um, on the chat. 
and it was kind of early on um what's the right balance between choice and direction for kids and he used the child's name so you know who this is i feel like charles often struggles with too many choices when direction and support might help him learn better um or be more successful great so clearly i give too many choices no um <laughs> but when they're really young, I think you give them two, two, two options is kind of what the direction is and you guide it, you know, so if it's, I don't want to, um, brush my teeth, it's okay. Do you want to, you can brush your teeth with the sparkly toothpaste or, oh, you could brush your teeth in the sink kitchen, right? You kind of, it's sort of making up some mind games with them is what I call it, but you make them think like, oh, this could be fun, this could be different. Um, but when they're really young, you give them kind of two concrete choices that they can go from. And if they don't want either, um, then you say, okay, well, these are the choices that we have right now. I mean, that's where you are giving choices, but you're setting boundaries. Um, sure, I think as a child gets older, you want that that's the stage they're in. They want to have control and power and take that initiative. And so they want to have more choices and they're going to push back. Um, so I think the more that you can tone it down and just give a few options and say, okay, these are our choices right now and choose, choose one, um, you know, give them two or three as they get older, um, rather than just kind of all the choice in the world. But I also want to say, choose your battles. I don't actually care sometimes, just fine. You know, do we really want to die on this this hill? And and I've learned as as kids get older, there are some things that um, you can just say. You know what? Then you're going to have the natural consequence of not doing this thing that you need to do, and that's your choice. Um, so it can be a little bit more abstract as they as their brain develops and they can get a little older and understand those natural consequences a little bit more. Does, and if you have a, a question, go ahead and unmute. Oh, here, I can see the chat now. Okay. Oh, there's one more that popped up. Do you see the chat? Yeah, I'd like to have engagement. No, that's a really good question. Um, and there's some people on the phone, so they might not know what the question is. Okay, sorry. So it says, I feel like my child would like to have engagement and attention and back and forth all the time. How do you set boundaries for this when you legitimately need to get work done? So I think some things that have been helpful, um, if you know you, you need to get something done, um, I, I heard a lot of this during COVID when families were home with kids, but if you can have a schedule, a, a loose, you know, kind of schedule at your house where it's, you know, this is independent playtime. Um, this is where mom needs to get something done. I think that that can be really helpful. So I, again, I don't know your schedule. I don't know if it's, you know, you're working from home and you really need to get work done or you're trying to do laundry or whatnot. Um, but being able to have some set times for kids where this is independent playtime, independent playtime is really important and kids need to know how to entertain themselves sometimes. And so you can create an actual schedule for that. But I think getting on their level and just saying, okay, I can tell that you need my attention right now. So you're validating, you are connecting. You say, I, need, I know you need my attention. So what do you need from me right now? And I'm going to give you X amount of time and then I have to get this done. So make a plan. What are you going to do while I get X, Y, and Z done? And you know, this is what I need. And you're setting the boundary and you're setting the structure. And I think being able to always say, you know, if I'm busy and I can't be there right now, I love you and I need to get these things done. So a lot of, and I love you and, <laughs> um, um, but I think, it can be helpful to, to create a schedule to um, really encourage independent playtime to say when when I need to do this, what can you do so set them up for success. Um, but validate I, I can see you need my attention right now. Tell me what you need, I will give it to you, you can have three minutes of my time and then I need, you know, 10 minutes to do this set a timer. So create some structures and boundaries around that um, as much as you can, but it's hard because yeah, kids, kids want our attention. I cannot do a thing when Charles is here. The second I get on the phone with anybody, he is in my face. So um, that's also just a really natural thing for kids also.
Anybody else? Hi. <laughs> Hi. Um, I have a quick question. Um, because I've been, I've been uh, really quick. Um, my two kids and my eight-year-old and my four, almost five-year-old share a room, and um, the the struggle is that one wakes up like at five thirty in the morning every day and goes and wakes up the other. It, and it's like they take turns and, and like they, they, they like cannot sleep past 6 a.m. So um, like this morning, I just, it was 6 a.m. and I already lost it. And it, it was just like, and then right now thinking of like, what can a natural con consequence be is for that. And for like, they, they get up and they go turn the light and like all you hear is ah, like running from one side to the other. So like, we all are up at 5.30 in the morning. So like, what I mean, how can I discipline or how I but how can I set rules or boundaries? But I mean, I can't physically like I cannot control them getting up or or being awake, I guess. Yeah, I, I, I'm really struggling with that. Yeah, I my child has just decided he wanted to get up really early. All I don't know, you know, it's, it's hard because we're in the same boat where you say, please, can you just stay in your bed? for a little bit longer, right? Um, so again, a lot of this is just normal, um, <laughs> developmentally appropriate. And I think um, depending on the age, so again, we wanna, th if they're able to take someone else's perspective, which your eight-year-old should be able to do um, and your younger one's getting there, is talking about some, like what are our needs that we have? We need to be able to sleep, we need to be able to eat and kind of having this conversation and I it would not be in the morning with them. It, I, maybe it's around bedtime. Maybe it's something you do at dinner time. So there's got to be this element of surprise and novelty with kids when you're trying to introduce something to them. It can't be when they're expecting it and they think it's a lecture. So you kind of have to be like, you know, I really want to talk about like, what do we need to feel good in the morning? And, and you can say, I'm a grown up and I have a need and my need is this. And when this happens, um, I feel really tired. And so how can we as a family come up with a plan to make sure we're all feeling healthy and ready to take on the day in the morning? And it starts to put a little bit more um, ownership onto them to recognize what, how their behaviors are making you feel. And it's okay as a parent to have feelings and frustrations. And I think what we get stuck in is we want to voice that to them in the moment when we're mad or they're upset and they're not hearing it. But if we can find that really nice time to say, you know, this is really hard for me and I feel like I can't be my best mom self in the mornings to you all because I'm tired and I'm frustrated and I don't want that. So how can we come up with a new plan, help them come up with the plan. And then it's their idea. And then you can remind them, you know, Hey, remember, this was our plan. Um, this is where positive reinforcement can be helpful. So if you guys get up in the morning, here are some options. Do this, this, and this, and you know, turn on a light. So we have a little flashlight in my kids' room. You know, if if you can be quiet, if you can let mom sleep to this time, you know, let's think of some things to earn. But this is starting to really interfere with the family dynamic. And you know, that makes me feel frustrated or tired. And so um, so sometimes that can be really helpful is give them the ownership to have a new plan. Um, and then some positive reinforcement for those types of behaviors, I think can be really helpful. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. Anyone else? I know we went over a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? I don't see anything in the chat. Am I? Thank you so much. Of course. <laughs> I've got lists of things that I jotted down and um, I so appreciate this. Definitely. And I think just, you know, people are gone, but if anyone's watching the recording, I think building on this will be kind of focusing on more of that emotion regulation and um, emotional literacy and helping our kids manage feelings kind of after this basic knowledge of development. So that's my hope for our future workshops. Great. All right. Well, thanks everyone for coming. Bye everyone. Thank you. Thank you.